I sighed to myself and closed my laptop. The hurricane force winds and torrential rain pounding against the office windows drowned out its tiny little built-in speakers easily. I guess I wouldn't be passing the time with Netflix after all. I got up from my desk and walked around the office. The large windows which normally provided an excellent view of the harbor were completely blacked out by the storm. Even the large LED floodlights that normally illuminated the parking lot were barely visible through the horizontal downpour of water that the sky was throwing at us. My boss liked to keep someone on overnight in weather like this just in case a boat, or God forbid one of the floating docks, broke free in the wind, but realistically I couldn't see anything and I certainly wasn't able to go outside if anything did happen tonight. I had sat through thunderstorms in this office before, but this one was especially bad. So much so that even Mike, this guy who lived on his boat all summer, had gone into town to stay with a friend just in case. That's how you knew it was bad. The whole office shook as a wave pounded into the glass that faced out towards the bay. I will never understand why whoever designed this place decided to build the office right on the break wall that protects these small recreational boats from the wrath of the Great Lakes. And furthermore, why they decided to make the wall that faces the lake almost entirely out of glass. I guess it's because in normal weather it offers a good view of the water and any vessels entering the harbor, but in storms like this it really makes you feel exposed. I pulled out my phone to check the time. It was just about 2 in the morning. Great, just 4 more hours until I can go home and get some sleep. Another wave hit the glass and the office shook again, but this time it was amplified by the loud crack of thunder and lightning that seemed to hit in perfect sync with the wave. I wasn't sure, but I thought for a split second I could see something out in the lake illuminated by the lightning, but of course it was now dark again so I couldn't check. I told myself it was probably one of the channel markers being thrown around in the waves, and sat back down at my desk. I had only been sitting down for a few minutes when the VHF radio mounted to the shelf above my desk began to crackle. I played with the squelch knob a bit to try and see if I could get a fix on the signal, but I couldn't make out anything. Probably just some interference from all the lightning. Another five minutes went by and the radio crackled again, but this time it sounded like a voice, but I couldn't make out what it was saying. I played with the radio settings a bit more to see if I could make it out, but Marine VHF radio doesn't have as much settings that you can adjust compared to CB radio, so there wasn't much I could do. Finally after a few more minutes, a crystal clear transmission came through the radio that made my blood run cold. Harbor Master, this is Moon Shadow, over. The voice was practically screaming into the radio in order to be heard over the howling wind. I froze there for a second realizing that this meant someone was out there on the lake in this crazy weather. Perhaps what I had seen in the lightning was a boat, but who would be insane enough to venture out in this? As if the storm had read my mind, another flash of lightning followed by an almost instantaneous boom of thunder lit up the night sky. And there, coming over the top of a massive wave, was a sailboat maybe 10 kilometers offshore. Even with the mainsail fully reefed, the boat was still heeled over at least 45 degrees as it battled with the wind. When everything went dark again, I was still staring in the direction of the boat and realized that it had no lights on, not even the navigation lights which struck me as odd. But then again I could only barely see the floodlights in the parking lot so maybe the storm was obscuring them. Coming back to reality, I snatched the mic for the radio off its mount and pressed down the talk button. Moon Shadow, this is Harbor Master. Go ahead. Over. Ah, oh, thank God. The man on the other end exclaimed. I didn't think anyone would be monitoring the radio this late. It's so good to hear someone's voice. Listen, I'm a 35 feet sailboat. I've lost my engine as well as all electrical power so I'm on a handheld radio. I need to get out of this storm, but that means I'm gonna have to come into the harbor under sail. I'm gonna need some help on the dock. Over. I know I'm terrible for thinking this, but my first thought was, oh great, that means I've gotta go out on the docks in this weather. But I quickly got over it as this man was definitely in trouble. I pulled up the harbor map on the computer that shows which docks are currently occupied, and tried to find an easy one for him to sail into. I keyed the mic again. Roger that moon shadow, looks like you're in luck, dock B13, that's Bravo, 1, 3, is open and it'll be ahead of you once you come around the pier past the beacon light. I'll come catch you there. Thank you. The man's voice replied on the radio. I'll try not to bump it too hard when I go in. 
He chuckled a little bit sounding relieved. I keyed the mic again to reply. Don't worry about it, you do what you gotta do to get in safe, and we'll clean up the mess in the morning, Harbor Master standing by on 68. Roger, Moon Shadow standing by on 68. I grabbed one of the handheld VHF radios off the charger, and began putting on my rain gear to head outside. I also grabbed a life jacket because there was no way I was going out on the docks in this weather without one. Even with the break wall protecting the harbor in storms like this, there was often still some wave action moving the docks up and down. I stood there in all my gear staring out the office door, trying to prepare myself for what was to come. Although I couldn't see it, somewhere in that black chaos was a sketchy old Ford F-250 we bought from the city's parks department to use as a work truck around the harbor. That would be my safe haven once I left the office, I just had to reach it. The office door was extremely difficult to open, but I managed to push it into the wind just enough to slide out between it and the frame. The wind slammed it shut behind me and I stood there pinned against the wall by the wind. The storm was so loud and all I could see was darkness, I felt so disoriented but I knew if I just walked forward far enough, the truck was straight ahead somewhere. I began placing one foot in front of the other, slowly battling my way through the wind and rain. This was bad enough on land, I couldn't imagine this poor man going through this on a boat that was heaving up and down out there in the waves. After what felt like an eternity, my hand touched something metal in front of me. I felt around a bit and realized it was the tailgate of the pickup truck. Running my hand along the side of the bed, I eventually made my way to the cab, then found the door handle. The dome lights finally allowed me to see something when I opened the door, the wind nearly ripping it off its hinges. It took practically all the strength I had to pull the door shut against the wind, but I managed to do it. I looked back towards the office out the rear window, and I could just barely see the lights of the building. Thankfully between the parking lot floodlights and the truck headlights I was able to see well enough as I made my way over to the ramp leading down to a dock. My plan was to sit in the truck and wait until the last possible second before running out into the storm to catch the lines of the incoming boat. Truthfully though, I was having my doubts that I would be of any help given the situation outside. The truck rocked from side to side as the wind battered it from outside, but somehow it felt more secure than the glass office. I made it to a dock and parked with the headlights facing out towards the water. The only other light visible was the bright beacon light that cut through the storm out at the end of the pier that was once used for commercial shipping back in the day. In the storm it seemed like a mighty lighthouse, but in reality it was just a galvanized steel tower about 20 feet high with a large LED light fixed to the top. As with many industries, modern technology has removed a lot of that romance of the sea that you see in movies. Still at this moment, I'm sure that poor man thought that light was Jesus himself, guiding him to shore. Harbor Master, this is Moon Shadow, you there. The man's voice came over the radio I had set on the dash of the truck. Moon Shadow, this is Harbor Master. Yeah, I am in position at B Dock, over. I replied. Good, would you mind talking to me a bit, about anything? He asked sheepishly. Things are getting pretty nasty out here and it makes me feel less alone. I had no idea what to say, what was I supposed to talk about. It felt weird to make small talk with him over the radio, but if it helped him I guess I had to come up with something. Uh, well I guess, what's your name? I asked him over the radio. Robert. He replied, what's yours? I was about to reply when suddenly another flash of lightning lit up the sky, followed by the loudest boom of thunder I have ever heard in my life. Like the bomb dropped on Hiroshima probably didn't make as much noise as this clap of thunder did, that's how loud it was. I ducked down in the truck instinctively out of fear, my ears were ringing and I was amazed the windows hadn't blown out. What the hell was that? I heard Robert yell over the radio. I've lost sight of your beacon light, is everything alright over there? I sat back up in my seat and looked over to where the beacon light should be, and sure enough he was right, there was no sign of it. That lightning strike must have blown the breaker, I'll have to reset it. I replied into the radio. I put the truck in reverse and backed out of the parking space, and began driving towards the pier. I dreaded having to get out of the truck to open the electrical panel on the side of the tower, but it needed to be done. At least there was a bit of a canopy over it that would offer me some protection. I reached the pier and turned the truck out onto it and saw one of the most horrific sights I had ever seen. 
Through the dim headlights, I could see what looked like a pile of twisted metal laying on the end of the pier. As I drew closer, I could see it was the beacon light tower. It looked like it had buckled and folded in half, and then been welded in that position like some kind of modern art sculpture that had then been kicked over. Some other parts of the tower had been bent outwards like spikes, and in the current weather conditions, the whole thing looked like some kind of grotesque creature. Moonshadow, this is Harbor Master. We have a situation. I said into the radio. Looks like that lightning strike took out the whole tower. I didn't entirely believe my own words. That tower got hit by lightning all the time. It had a lightning rod and it was built to take it. It would have taken some serious force to twist it like what I was seeing in front of me. Well, that would be my luck. Robert said over the radio. I'm on the pier in a pickup truck. Can you see my headlights? I quickly asked him. No, I don't. He replied after a minute. Just then, I remembered when we bought this truck, the city hadn't removed any of the warning lights from it. What about now? I radioed back after flicking the switch to turn them on. Yes, I see you. He said excitedly. I felt a bit of relief as another flash of lightning revealed Robert's boat was much closer to the harbor mouth now. The thunder came a few seconds later, now indicating the storm was moving away finally. My relief was short-lived, however, as the radio suddenly crackled to life again. No, damn it. I heard before the radio cut off again. Robert, are you okay? I asked into the radio, all professional marine radio language being thrown out the window at this point. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, just had a knockdown, mast hit the water but the boat righted itself and I'm still on board so. He trailed off. What the hell is that? Robert. I yelled into the radio. Something just ripped out one of my starboard shrouds. He replied. I think it was a wave, but I swear it was like an arm came out of the water and just tore it off. I'm gonna have to tack around, put my port side into the wind to keep the mast up. For those unfamiliar, a shroud is the steel cables on either side of a sailboat mast that keep it up, so losing one is pretty serious. I saw in another flash of lightning, Robert began to turn the boat, but just before everything went dark again, the boat rolled onto its side in a wave. I frantically tried to raise him on the radio, but it was no good. There was only silence on the radio for a good five minutes, until another flash of lightning revealed Robert's boat now floating upright again, but with no mast. My heart sank, with no engine and no mast, he now had no way of reaching land. I still heard nothing, but realizing he was now probably trying to hail the Coast Guard, I quickly switched my radio to channel 16. Sure enough, there was Robert's voice again. Mayday, mayday, this is sailing vessel Moon Shadow. I am dismasted and drifting with no engine, need immediate assistance, over. Moon Shadow, this is the Coast Guard, we can send a vessel to your location. But in this weather ETA is an hour, over. At this point I could only listen helplessly while Robert coordinated with the Coast Guard. It was out of my hands now and I drove back to the office. At this point the rain was beginning to let up and visibility was improving as the first glimpses of daylight began to peek over the horizon. When I got back into the office, I was glued to the window facing the bay. I didn't care if a wave came and smashed the whole wall in, I was watching for any sign of Robert's boat or a Coast Guard ship approaching. With every lightning flash, I could see the helpless sailboat being swept farther and farther from shore. Eventually, the lights of a Coast Guard cutter came into view from across the bay, and I felt a little relief. It was now 5 in the morning and the sun was beginning to rise, and the storm was clearing. The waves, however, had not subsided. I could see the sailboat being tossed like a toy as the cutter drew closer. I could see through the binoculars, Robert climbing on top of his boat and firing off a flare. No sooner had he done this, when two absolutely massive waves a good 15 feet higher than the rest seemed to materialize out of thin air on either side of the boat. It was like the lake had massive jaws, it was opening up to swallow the boat, and indeed that's what happened. The water between the waves began to lower, taking the boat with it, and then the massive jaws slammed shut crushing the little boat like a bug between them, and then disappeared amongst the other waves. Just like that, Robert and his boat were gone, without a trace. As the sun came up that day, the waves calmed and it turned into one of the most beautiful summer days you've ever seen. They never found a body or even the wreck of moon shadow. I'm not one to believe in this sort of thing, but there was something about that storm, it wasn't natural.
I have never experienced anything like that before, and even the repairmen who came out to rebuild the beacon light were baffled as to how it was destroyed in that manner. I'm convinced that Robert somehow angered the lake, as crazy as that sounds, because something certainly wanted him gone that night. Sure, you could chalk it up to increasingly violent storms due to climate change, but two opposing waves like the ones that swallowed up Robert's boat should not be possible. I don't know what, but something beyond my understanding took him out that night, I am convinced of it. Perhaps the strange phenomenon I witnessed that night is also what caused the unexplained sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald all those years ago. But either way, I don't think I'll be going out on the Great Lakes anytime soon. Thursday, February 16th. This morning I awoke violently to the most dreadful sound I've ever heard. An ear-splitting screech echoed through the hull of my boat, and the vessel came to an abrupt stop. Quickly, I crawled out of bed and tried to gather my bearings. As I exited the bedroom, my feet were greeted by a cold splash. I looked down to see the entire floorboard covered in an inch-deep carpet of seawater. Flurries of thoughts raced through my mind, and I began to fear the worst. As I wondered whether or not I had struck a reef, my eyes caught a glimpse of something sharp and rusty poking out of the wall on the starboard side of the saloon. It was some kind of metal spike, roughly three inches in diameter. It was about chest height and had obviously impaled the hull. Water flooded in from the small openings between the spike and the hull in rhythm with the waves as they crashed into the boat. I rushed over to my utility closet, splashing through the water as I scuffled across the cabin. There, I began frantically rummaging through the unorganized mess of the various tools and supplies I had gathered over the years. As I searched, I could feel the water level slowly rising. I imagined the boat as an hourglass and the water as sand. Each grain of sand that poured in through the hull only led me closer and closer to an untimely burial at sea. When I had finally located what I was looking for, I hurried over to the spike. There, I began sealing the cracks with waterproof tape reinforced with some kind of fast drying putty. Due to the sheer size of the spike, I wasn't able to remove it completely. Though, I wouldn't if I could either. The spike served as a blockade, and without it, the cabin would have been flooded in mere seconds. I'm sure you've heard that you should never pull out a knife from a stab wound. This is because the knife aids in sealing up the wound, preventing even more from pouring out. Well, the same concept applies here. Thankfully, stopping the leakage proved to be no challenge. But now that things have quieted down, I am beginning to realize that my problems aren't over just yet. I am in the middle of the Atlantic, weeks away from the nearest continent, and I am stuck here for the foreseeable future. I went up to the deck immediately after sealing up the leak, and I discovered that the spike is actually attached to a greater structure that runs deep beneath the ocean surface. It almost seems to be some kind of large metal spire, it's covered in rust and barnacles, and a great portion of it rises several feet above the water. It has four sharp spikes protruding from each side, one of which is the one that has pierced my hull. I will investigate further tomorrow. Friday, February 17th. I spent the remainder of yesterday hauling flood water out of the cabin. It took me several hours to accomplish, but at least it's dry down there again. Mostly, anyway. I have also furled up all the sails on the boat, and they will remain so indefinitely unless I somehow manage to get free from the spire without a hitch, which I highly doubt. This was done so that the spike wouldn't break open the hull again when a powerful gust of wind hits the sails. As for the spire, I am no closer to understanding what it is or why it's there. I hopped in for a swim this morning in order to better survey the structure, and as soon as I breached the surface, an overwhelming sensation of dread overcame me. I have lived by the sea my entire life and have never been affected by the fear of deep water before, but seeing how deep that structure descended into the dark and murky depths below sent shivers up my spine. I don't know quite how to explain it, but the whole situation felt strange. Yes, I am aware that the structure itself is inherently an anomaly, but that's not what I am talking about here. I felt this sort of low hum radiating through my body as I swam, and all of a sudden I felt exposed paranoid that something would emerge from the deep and drag me down with it. I looked down and through my swimming goggles, stared into the blue abysmal ocean depths, and I swear I could feel something staring back at me. Needless to say, I quickly got back on the boat after that. 
I think it will be a while before I dare enter the ocean again. Friday, February 17th. Entry number two. After my morning swim with the spire, I began attempting to establish contact with emergency services. I didn't think I would need to write another entry for today, but a couple of strange things have been happening, so I reckon it is for the best if I document everything moving forward. Firstly, radio signals seem to be wavering. Whenever I try to communicate over the airwaves, I get in return only a chorus of static with some barely intelligible chatter scattered in there somewhere. I also have an extremely weak internet connection, but considering how frail it is, I might as well be offline. I have broadcasted an SOS signal multiple times now, but I am unsure if it has actually reached anybody or not. If someone is indeed coming, it would take about a week or two to reach me, depending on what kind of ship they're using. Hopefully, my rescuers will arrive by way of aircraft, because I'm not terribly confident that my makeshift plug will last more than a few days at best, and I would hate to one morning wake up on the bottom of the ocean. I will spend the rest of my evening trying to reach the mainland, but as it stands, I don't have high hopes. I will admit my circumstances are beginning to look more dire with each passing second, and I am starting to become increasingly worried that I will actually perish out here. February 18th. I woke up to a small leak today, but I managed to seal it up with relative ease. I still haven't heard back from any emergency services, and the radio is no different today than it was yesterday. Contemplating my options, I sat on the deck basking in the lukewarm mid-Atlantic morning sun when I heard a strange sound. It sounded like a faint splash, sticking out from the calm ocean ambience like a sore thumb. Instinctively, I looked down, searching for the source of the sound. I scanned the azure waters without finding anything at first, and I was ready to give up when I laid my eyes on a peculiar stream of bubbles rising to the surface. As they breached the water, the signature splashing sound could be heard. Momentarily satisfied that I managed to locate the noise, I began pondering what it could actually be. I'd never seen anything like it before. Sure, I've seen bubbles before in my ten years of sailing, but this was different. Before I had the chance to come up with a plausible explanation, they suddenly disappeared. Puzzled, I stared out into the blue expanse, looking for any trace of what could have caused them. Then, I heard a familiar sound a little to my left. As I turned my head, I once again saw the focused stream of bubbles rising to the surface, only this time it was closer to the stern. I walked across the deck and resumed studying the strange phenomenon. The bubbles were too far away from the boat for it to be the cause, and the only other explanation for what it could be that I could think of was a passing submarine, or perhaps a hydrothermal vent, although it looked to be neither. Before I had the chance to reach a satisfying conclusion, the bubbles perpetually increased in size and ferocity, and it was as if that particular point in the ocean had all of a sudden turned into a raging jacuzzi. The bubbles erupted from the surface and spewed water everywhere, and I felt a few droplets trickle down my forehead. But just as suddenly as they had appeared, they vanished without a trace, and the ocean was put in an eerie state of tranquility. Dumbfounded, I stood there in silence, wondering if what I had just seen had even occurred, or if it was just a figment of my imagination. I got my answer pretty quickly though, as I spotted movement writhing beneath the waves. I leaned forward on the railing, intently inspecting the strange object that was emerging from deep below me. As it got closer, reflective shades of a greenish white began to shimmer in the sunlight. As the creature surfaced, a quizzical grimace contoured across my face and I was left with more questions than answers. With its belly up, the fish lifelessly rose to the top of the water. It looked to be a standard Atlantic herring. A small silver-colored fish that has provided me with many excellent meals during my time at sea. But seeing it just turn up dead like that made me feel uneasy. Surely it must have been connected to those strange bubbles, right? As I contemplated grabbing my net, and fishing it out of the sea, I spotted movement in the corner of my eye. I turned around to see another herring, mere feet away from the first, also floating lifelessly in the water. Then another one surfaced a short distance away, followed by another, and then yet another. The eerie sight made my jaw drop to the floor, and I stood there perplexed, just watching the dozens of dead fish floating on the waves. I still can't wrap my mind around how or why that happened. As I said, the mysterious stream of bubbles must have been responsible in some way, but how? I wish I had an adequate internet connection so that I could google it or something. 
As for the rest of the day, nothing remarkable happened. I have decided to spend the remainder of the evening inside the cozy confines of the cabin, as I feel a bit apprehensive about staying out on deck now, especially after dark. First the spire, and now this. I don't know, something just feels a bit odd. Can't wait to get the hell out of here. Sunday, February 19th. I have no idea how I didn't notice them before. Whilst preparing breakfast in the galley, I glanced over to the thick spike still pierced through the hull. I routinely inspected for leaks when my eyes caught a strange pattern engraved on the rusty surface. I put down my sizzling frying pan and walked over to investigate. Upon closer examination, I could faintly make out a series of strange patterns and symbols. They looked to be runes of some kind. I ripped out a page from this very logbook, placed it on top of the icons, and started tracing them with a pencil. Once finished, I was left with four other worldly symbols. Two of them looked like a hashtag coupled with tiny spirals scattered about, and the remaining two are way too intricate, and detailed for me to be able to even attempt to describe. This only made me more curious as to what the purpose and origins of the spire truly are. How deep does it descend? What lies at the bottom? What does it do? These were all questions I vowed to answer, and so I came up with a plan to do so. In my late twenties, I used to work part-time as an assistant oceanographer. One of the projects I worked on required us to use these specialized deep-sea cameras to chart the bottom of a trench right by the southern coast of Argentina. These cameras were able to withstand immense pressure, up to 500 atmospheres to be exact. It also just so happens that I own one of these cameras, though I haven't used it in close to half a decade. Hopefully, it will still turn on. If it doesn't, I'll just abandon the idea. My plan is to attach the recording camera to a rope and lower it to the seafloor next to the spire, in hopes that I may come closer to understanding this enigmatic structure once and for all. As I'm writing this, I just notice some water spilling into the cabin, so I'll have to take care of that first. But after that, I'll spend the rest of the day preparing the equipment for the abysmal descent. Hopefully, I can get things ready and going by noon, if not I'll postpone the expedition until tomorrow morning. Sunday, February 19th. Entry number 2. Thank god the camera still worked. I spent close to an hour tweaking and modifying it, restoring it to its full functionality once more. Under normal circumstances, it is possible to view the camera feed live through the use of a computer and even make real-time movements and zoom-ins with it. But for some reason, the computer is unable to maintain a steady connection with the camera for longer than a minute before everything cuts to static, so I opted for a more traditional method. The plan was to set the camera to record, and then manually lower it to the seafloor. There, I'll let it sit for a couple of minutes before reeling it back up to the surface. After that, I'll connect it to the computer, and review the footage. Hopefully, I will get clear imaging even though I can't control it remotely. And so I did just that. I tied a strong nylon rope around the camera and securely fastened it. I have a near endless supply of ropes and cords in my utility closet, so I was never worried about running out of depth. I picked up the equipment and went up on deck. It was the middle of the afternoon, but I still had a couple of hours left of sunlight. I tied the other end of the rope to the railing of the boat, and I set the camera to record. As I walked up to the starboard side, right next to where the spire breached the surface of the water, I stared down into the cold depths below. The ocean somehow seemed darker today, coated in an unnerving veil of dark black. I shuddered for a moment, but then felt relief in the fact that it was only the camera that would get submerged, and not myself. I double-checked to see if everything was still working as intended, and then I carefully lowered the camera into the water. I watched as it slowly faded from view, sinking deeper and deeper into the abyss. It was an eerie sight. As I kept on lowering the camera, I pictured all the things that could be down there. I imagined an abundance of rare deep-sea fish, and creepy crustaceans with uncomfortably long limbs. You know, the sorts of things one would expect populating the ocean floor your typical anglerfish and horseshoe crabs. Maybe even a giant squid if I was lucky. But then I wondered what else would be down there. What unnatural sights would greet me as the camera reached the base of the spire? What was at the bottom? Atlantis. Rapture. Mermaids. I'm not sure how long I stood there, endlessly lowering hundreds upon hundreds of feet of rope down into the murky sea. 
I glanced up and watched as the sun was beginning to set on the horizon, painting everything in a serene orange hue. And then I felt the rope relax, as if the camera had finally reached the seafloor. A jolt of excitement coursed through me, and I actually felt a bit nervous. In my mind, I pictured what the camera was looking at at this very moment, and soon, I would be able to view it as well. I let it sit on the bottom for a couple of minutes before I began the tedious task of reeling it back up. Things were going well until I suddenly felt a bit of resistance, while pulling. I looked down and observed a strange abundance of bubbles rising to the surface, similar to the bubbles I had seen only a couple of days prior. I thought it was strange, but continued as usual. But then, to my utter shock and horror, the rope began violently tugging, the same way a fishing rod does once you've caught something big. I was completely perplexed, and I began panicking. I strained my arms and desperately tried to resist, but whatever force was pulling the other end of the rope was way stronger than me. The tugging became so violent that I had to let go of the rope out of fear of rope burn. I watched helplessly as more and more rope flew over the edge of the boat, and disappeared into the water. Whatever it was kept dragging the camera further away from the boat. Soon, there wouldn't be enough rope left, and it would start tugging on the boat's railing. Would it break the railing? Or maybe, as absurd as it seems, start dragging the boat under. I couldn't chance it. I rushed downstairs into the cabin and grabbed the first knife I could find. I hurried back up and began severing the knot that was tied around the starboard side railing. Beside me, I could hear the sound of rope rapidly flying overboard with each passing second. A wave of relief washed over me as the knife cut the last fiber of the knot, releasing its grasp on the boat. Though it was regrettable that I had just lost my expensive deep sea camera equipment, I was just happy to be out of harm's way. The last piece of rope sank into the ocean, and a sudden sense of serenity was cast across the waves. Everything was quiet, and the sun was setting. Cautiously, I moved toward the edge, once more staring into the hostile world below, and I questioned the events prior. My mind raced to come up with a logical explanation, but I fell short. Did a shark accidentally swallow the camera? The force seemed a bit excessive for it to be a shark. And why would it move so fast and violently if it did? A great sadness fell upon me as I realized I would never be able to see the astonishing footage the camera had recorded, and the mysteries of the spire would forever remain unanswered. If only I had been able to view it live. As I am writing this entry, I realize that I am left with a newfound fear of the ocean now. Everything that has been happening these past few days has warped my perception of what used to be a place of happiness for me. Had the events of today even occurred? It all feels so surreal, so implausible. I think it's best that I go to bed now, it's been a rough day. But as the boat rocks up and down on the waves, I will lay in my bed and imagine the abyss and the creatures that lurk just out of reach below me. Good night. Monday, February 20th. More dead fish floated up to the surface today. At least 50 by my count. I'm apprehensive about cooking them out of fear that whatever caused their demise might still remain in them as a toxin, or something. The last thing I need is food poisoning, or worse. I have also had a few strange sightings of something circling the boat. The first time I saw it was this morning when I sat on the deck, doing maintenance on some lines that had twisted. I heard a kind of blowing sound, reminiscent of when a whale or dolphin surfaces to take a breath. I quickly turned around just as the culprit fully submerged itself. I wasn't able to get a clear view, but I saw a dark shadow disappear beneath the waves. Initially, I suspected it may have been an orca, and this got me a bit anxious as killer whales have been known to attack sailboats on multiple occasions. I continued working but remained vigilant. The next and last sighting happened in the afternoon, just as the sun was beginning its descent on the horizon. It had been a very humid day, and as a result, a thick layer of fog rested on top of the water. I was inspecting the peculiar weather phenomena when I initially spotted it. Way off in the distance, maybe a mile out in the ocean, I saw a dark circular shape poke out of the water, still as a statue. Thinking it may have been debris at first, strained my eyes to properly gauge what I was looking at. Glistening rays of light went through the thick haze from above, and I saw the light bounce off the wet object, along with two reflective dots that stared right back at me. And then, whatever it was blinked. The whole ordeal reminded me of that famous Theodore Kittleson painting. 
My heart sank as I realized that whatever I was looking at was alive and observing me just as I was observing it. I was revolted and took a step back, only to see the entity vanish under the water. A couple of hours passed since and I was in the galley cooking supper. The strange sightings had almost slipped my mind when I heard a bone chilling sound. Coming from the porthole behind me, I heard a distinct tapping on the window. Goosebumps flooded my body and I didn't dare turn around, frightened by what I may have seen on the other side of that glass. The tapping continued, ominously echoing throughout the cabin. Then an ear-splitting screech filled the air. Do you know the sound a chalkboard makes when you drag your nails across it? Yeah, it sounded just like that. Against every fiber of my being telling me not to turn around, I looked over my shoulder, but I saw nothing. Nothing except for three distinct scratch marks running along the glass surface of the porthole. I quickly locked my cabin door, pulled over the curtains, and began writing this entry. As I'm sitting here, fearful of what lurks outside, I desperately hope that emergency services are on their way. I don't know how much longer I have. Tuesday, February 21st. The oppressive darkness of the night still dominated the sky as I awoke this morning. Confused, I checked my watch and it read 4.23 in the morning. I wasn't due to wake up for another three hours, but for some reason I laid wide awake in bed, listening to the waves crashing into the sailboat. I made an attempt to look out of the small porthole situated across the room, but I saw nothing but a void. People often underestimate how dark it can actually get out at sea. In the middle of the night, it is impossible to see anything further away than where the light emitted from your boat can reach. You can't even see the water surrounding you, only a vacuum of darkness. I'm not prone to randomly waking up this early, so I laid still, listening for any out-of-place sounds. I was on high alert, and I felt slightly paranoid. Remembering the strange events of the day prior didn't exactly help either. My subconscious mind was obviously telling me that something was wrong, but I had no idea of knowing what or why. Then I heard it. A rhythmic creaking came from the deck above me. The sound was reminiscent of something heavy trudging across the boat. I sat up, intently concentrating on the noise. I heard the sound move from the front of the bow, all the way to the stern. They were slow and heavy footsteps. I was certain of it. Along with adrenaline, an immense sense of terror shot through my body and I froze in place. A part of me speculated that it may have been people from a rescue crew, though deep down I knew it was not the case. The steps moved in a sinister manner, I could tell. My ship could have been boarded by pirates, but it was highly unlikely I would encounter them all the way out here, especially in the middle of the night. I always made sure to turn off all the lanterns on the boat before going to bed. I heard the creaks move toward the door to the cabin, and I held my breath, praying that whatever was outside couldn't get in. A series of thuds echoed through the boat, and I felt the walls tremble as something was savagely bashing against the door. Terrified, I rose out of bed and grabbed the knife that rested on the nightstand, clutching it tightly in my pale hand. I stood there motionless, listening to the deafening beating of my heart accompanied by the banging of wood, as I pointed the knife toward the bedroom door. If whatever was out there managed to get into the cabin, it could just as easily rip down the frail bedroom door. Still, it provided me with some level of comfort knowing that there was at least one more barrier between us. But just as quickly as it had arrived, the barrage of thumping abruptly stopped, and everything fell quiet once more. The heavy steps moved away from the cabin door, and shortly after, a loud splash could be heard. Was it gone? I stood there for hours, frozen until the first rays of light danced across the waves, and the sun rose on the horizon. It was only then that I felt brave enough to step out of my room, and into the cabin. Nothing seemed out of place in the cabin, except for the giant protruding spike of course. But I dreaded opening the cabin door and stepping out on deck. What if it was still there, just waiting for me? What if it had all been a trick? Knife in hand, I finally mustered up the courage to approach the door. As I swung it open, my heart skipped a beat when I saw what greeted me. The exterior of the door was covered in scratch marks and deep indentations, and a pool of water had gathered on the floor. But that's not the sight that horrified me the most. No, far from it. What really got me worked up was seeing the deep sea camera that I lost yesterday sitting on the stairs leading up to the deck. It was battered and bruised, but it still remained somewhat intact. I quickly grabbed the camera and rushed inside. I booted up my computer and connected it to the camera. I didn't want to question why or how it ended up there, I was just thankful to have it back. 
While the footage was loading, I mentally prepared myself for the sights that it had captured. Tuesday, February 21st. Deep sea camera footage log. The recording starts off as you would expect. I can see myself turning the camera on and then bringing it toward the edge of the boat. I throw it overboard and the camera breaches the surface of the water. As it begins to sink, bubbles flood the screen, making it hard to see anything past them, but they eventually subside, and the top of the spire is revealed. The built-in depth display on the camera tells me how deep down it is in real time. At 50 feet beneath the waves, the spire broadens and becomes thicker and more sturdy. It is still covered in rust and barnacles. However, it stands as a stark contrast against the endless blue expanse. At the 1 minute and 50 seconds mark, the haunting cry of a whale can faintly be heard in the background through the device's microphone. As the camera sinks deeper, it becomes gradually darker in the ocean. At 100 feet it seems the spire connects to a larger rectangular foundation, like that of the top of a skyscraper. The building is covered in algae and seaweed, and it looks to be extraordinarily derelict. Though it might resemble a skyscraper in form, the architecture is completely alien in design. It looks like it's made out of rock or maybe concrete, with a few metal support beams scattered about. It also looks... organic. I don't know what else to call it. I guess it kind of reminds me of that weird church in Barcelona. The Sagrada Familia or whatever it's called. It has several ornamental lines and carvings stretching all the way down its surface. I can't understate how large this thing is. It takes up over half the screen. And the further down the camera sinks, the broader the structure becomes. At 350 feet small cavernous orifices begin to form along the walls. The openings look like they run deep within the structure and they seem intentional, as opposed to the product of erosion. Suddenly, a stream of bubbles obscures the camera feed, and it begins spinning uncontrollably. I lean forward in my chair and desperately try to look beyond the bubbles, but it is useless. A deafening static sound can also be heard as the camera shambles around. When the bubbles finally disperse, the camera stabilizes and finds itself down 600 feet below the surface. It's dark down here, but I'm still able to see the structure. If it gets dark enough, the camera will automatically turn on powerful floodlights and switch to night vision, so I'm not worried that I will lose the picture. The structure is cast in a dark blue hue now, and the surrounding ocean is nearly black at this point. A school of fish swims by, and I observe a multitude of crustaceans crawling along the surface of the building. The deeper down you get, the less the structure looks like a building, and instead resembles more natural subaquatic formations. What look to be corals make up the outer layer of the building now, but it is still possible to see original architecture with the decorative runes that are etched into the walls. The engravings look to contain the exact same symbols as those on the spike that I previously made a sketch of. At 800 feet, the ocean is completely black, and the device's automated floodlights kick in, illuminating the surrounding waters in a ghastly green glow. The orifices scattered about the structure are larger now, and if I were to guess, I would say they would serve as entrances into the building. A sudden crash catches me off guard, and I jolt up in my seat. The camera stands still. It seems I have reached the seafloor. Particles of sand fly everywhere, and the camera is temporarily blinded. Once the dust has settled, I get a clear view of the surrounding abyss. The sand below is completely white, and there are a couple of critters crawling along the ground. I gawk as I notice what has become of the structure. An enormous primordial gate meets my gaze. You could probably fit a blue whale in there if you tried. It is decorated with intricate patterns, and through the cracks of its massive iron doors, you can clearly see a bright light source emanating from somewhere within. Upon witnessing the extraordinary find, pits began to fill in my stomach, and shivers run up my spine. A sense of dread overtook me. Who or what was the gate for? I felt nauseous just at the thought of this structure even existing in the first place, much less that it was located directly below me. The camera lingers on the gate for a while before, in a jagged motion, it starts to ascend. This must have been the point where I started reeling it in. The gate is still visible as the camera rises upwards, though it is slowly fading out of frame. However, in the final moments before the gate is out of view entirely, a rapid commotion of shadows can be seen moving behind the gate, obscuring the light between the gaps. And just as the gate completely disappears from view, one can clearly see the doors begin to open. 
A loud creaking sound ripples through the water as the gate unlocks, and thousands of bubbles release from the newly formed opening, partially blinding the camera. As the camera continues to ascend, fast shadows swim by in the distance just out of reach, making them impossible to identify. A low-pitched and distorted cry is picked up by the microphone. The best way to describe it would be to say it sounded like a mix between a whale's cry and a dog's bark. I haven't heard anything like it before. Something swims by right in front of the camera and the device is sent spiraling out of control. Before it has the chance to stabilize itself, it is hit again and this time it is shrouded in darkness and the audio cuts out. The screen is black, but the depth display shows it descending at an impossibly fast rate. Then the feed cuts out. The video just stops. Horrified, I sat still in front of my computer, a flurry of thoughts racing through my mind, but none of them were pleasant. I examine the camera itself, and upon closer inspection see what looks to be bite marks stretched across its surface. I will spend the rest of my day fortifying the entire cabin, making sure that nothing can get in. I will make this sailboat an impenetrable fortress. I'm not taking any chances, not anymore. I have a feeling that whatever was here last night will return. Thursday, February 23rd. I'm afraid this might be my final entry. Yesterday was busy, so I didn't have time to write. I don't have much time now, so I'll try to make it short, I apologize. As mentioned earlier, I have fortified the entire sailboat, making it virtually impossible for anyone to get inside. And boy, am I glad I did. Last night, a flurry of attacks suddenly erupted from all sides of the boat. Without warning, something began aggressively scratching at the hull, banging on the door, biting at the walls, etc. You get the idea. I still don't know if there are more of them, or if it is just a large singular entity, but whatever it is desperately wants to get inside the cabin. And I fear it's not just for a social visit either. Thankfully it seems to be docile during the day, but just as soon the sun disappears from the horizon, it comes out to play. It is currently one hour until sundown, and I have done everything I could possibly do to prepare myself for the events that will transpire tonight. I have armed myself with several knives, and done some push-ups for morale. I am almost certain this will be my end, however, as the cabin door won't withstand another attack. And to top it all off, as if my situation couldn't get any more hopeless, a steady stream of water has begun leaking in from the damn spike stuck in my hull. I can't emphasize enough how much I loathe the sight of it. That thing is the sole reason I am caught up in my horrible conundrum in the first place. I'm not sure how many days I've been out here, I think it's only been a week. But it feels like a lifetime. Whatever happens tonight, my suffering here will come to an end. Though, I highly doubt I will emerge victorious. I have spent most of the day typing up all the relevant logs digitally, and hopefully, my frail internet connection is able to upload it somewhere. It will be my lasting legacy, and my story will serve as a cautionary tale to any sailors daring enough to cross the Atlantic. I can hear it outside now. Time is running out. I can hear a deep guttural growl bellow from the depths, and the sound is loud enough to send vibrations through the boat. Something is coming. This will be my final message. If you spot a giant rusty spire sticking out of the water in the middle of the ocean, stay clear of it at all costs. Whatever is down there is unfathomably ancient, and it is not made by humans. Goodbye. We had been checking weather reports tirelessly for two weeks, until we finally found our spot. The following week should be nothing but sun and smooth winds, so we tentatively decided that to be our slot. Our small crew consisted of me and my friends Josie, and Frank. Josie's dad owned the boat, and he still needed to sign off on our plan. So we had to reserve it ahead of time, and make sure that we got it back in pristine condition, on the dot, and preferably with a nice coating of wax or whatever they use to make boats shine like candied apples. Monday arrived and the weather was still solid, and Josie's dad had reluctantly signed off on our plan, so we decided not to wait any longer, and take it out the next day. The idea was to have a two-day mini-cruise. Just us hanging out on the boat and maybe docking it for the night at a nearby town. Although Josie's dad was a hardhead, he had taught her how to drive and maintain the boat since she was a kid, so really, the worst thing that could happen is that we wouldn't have enough snacks. 
Me and Frank met at the parking lot and saw Josie standing on the boat at the end of the dock. Her dad was with her, lecturing her about some winch or other, Josie rolling her eyes next to him, barely maintaining her attention. He really can't leave her alone even for a couple days, can he? Frank asked, keeping his voice low as we stepped on the long dock. Josie or the boat? Frank chuckled, then quickly returned his resting poker face as we reached the boat, Josie's dad turning around as he heard the planks creaking under our feet. Before he could say anything, Josie ran up from behind him and said, Hi boys. You brought the food and snacks and the five gallons of booze, I assume. Aye aye, Captain. We replied in unison. It was Josie's dad's turn to roll his eyes. Well, I'll leave you to it, he said to Josie, starting to walk down the small ramp down to the dock. And remember, two days, no more. I expect you to bring her back in one piece. Sure thing, dad. That was Josie's way of saying yes, I get it already. Josie's dad gave us a stern look followed by a slight nod as he walked past us. He never really liked me or Frankie, a bunch of hooligans, as he'd once called us when we were kids. For the record, me and Frankie didn't like the guy either, so at least the feeling was mutual. After her dad was out of earshot, Josie yelled, Are you ready, kids? Putting on her damnedest pirate voice. Aye, aye, Captain. We screamed and sprinted up the ramp and into the boat. After an exchange of hugs, we unloaded our groceries into the mini fridge below deck, then met up with Josie, who was already sitting inside the helm. Ready to leave, crew? She asked, Let's rock this boat, Frank replied. The amount of bad jokes this early in the morning was surely a great indication for what the rest of the day held. It wasn't long until the shore behind us was gone, the tranquil open sea spreading out in all directions. Josie seemed to know where we were going, but at that point I could no longer discern what direction we had even come from. Me and Frank sunbathed and joked around on the deck until Josie emerged from her cocoon-like control spot. Sorry to interrupt your hilarious hijinks, but I'd propose we have some lunch soon. Like destiny, the word lunch produced a unified grumble from both me and Frank's stomachs, the universal sound of, food please. We can stay here for a while, then we could start heading towards the town, Josie said. Feeling bad that she was doing all the heavy lifting, I asked her. You need any help? It's your boat, and us your honored guests, so don't be afraid to command us, Captain. Please. Josie replied, when I get a chance to drive this boat, I take it. Dad's been hogging it like crazy all summer. Besides, it's not like you guys even know what half of the things on this boat are called, let alone what they're used for. Well, that's the driver's seat. Frank said, pointing at the helm. That's called a helm, my dear. Frank, you just earned yourself the honorary job of heating up our lunch. This ain't no Ford Prius, I see. He replied as he got up and started to take lazy strides towards below deck. Toyota. I said. What? Prius is Toyota. Not Ford. Come on, let's go make lunch for the captain. I got up to follow Frank, nodding approvingly to Josie. We had cheap microwave meals for lunch, seeing as the boat didn't have a stovetop or an oven. For some reason, maybe it was the soothing sounds of the ocean lazily slapping the boat, or the warm afternoon sun, the food defied its low expectations and tasted great. Afterwards we had a little siesta where I almost fell asleep until Josie said, Shall I take course towards the town then? Through a straw hat laid across his face, Frank mumbled, Aye aye, you sure you don't need any help? I asked Josie once again, but she was already jumping into the helm, excited to get back at it. You guys just chill, I'll get us where we need to. As the motor's soothing hum returned, I got myself a bag of chips and sat on the deck, watching the horizon. Frank still had the hat on his face, which either meant that he didn't want to be bothered, or that he'd fallen asleep. Either way, I was happy to just sit under the sun as the boat slowly rolled towards our destination, cutting a line into the smooth water behind us. Prep. Josie screamed. I must have fallen asleep, and as I got up the half-eaten bag of chips crushed under my foot. What, Josie? What's wrong? What's going on? Frank parroted as he stood up, the hat falling beside him. There's a storm coming. Josie said as she frantically pressed buttons, her eyes darting across the dashboard of the helm. I turned around and looked at the horizon. Dread filled me as I saw an infinitely wide wall of dark clouds spread across the sky, making contact with the water in a misty gray curtain. 
I noticed that the ocean was no longer level, for it was rippled with small waves that thumped the sides of the boat in eager anticipation. I thought it was supposed to be nothing but clear skies, Frank said. He'd walk beside me, taking in the terror beyond the horizon. Exactly, Sherlock. It came out of nowhere, Josie snapped, holding the wheel tightly in her right hand as she fiddled something with her left. Okay, Josie, I know this might sound stupid, but bear with. Why are we going towards this storm? I asked, trying to not seem disingenuous as I turned around to face her. She gave a sigh, stopping what she was doing and looked me in the eyes. That's where the town is. It's the closest place to dock right now, and the storm's moving faster than any I've ever seen. If we go back it'll catch up to us and we're screwed. If we go through it, we'll spend the least amount of time inside it, giving us at least a chance. A chance at what? Frankie asked. A chance at getting out of here. Any port in a storm, I guess. I said, trying to lighten the mood. To which Frank gave me a concerned look. The air had turned cool, so I went and changed to warmer clothing, Frank doing the same. Coming back up to the top, I saw that the storm had moved closer. A lot closer. Josie instructed us to put on life jackets, and to stay below deck, not to come out unless she asked us to. We put on the puffy orange jackets and promptly hunkered down below. The increasing waves were already rocking the boat uneasily. Are we gonna die? Frank asked, his voice whimpering as he looked up at me from the opposite bench. Although the question had already burrowed itself into my mind as well, I replied, No, man, we're not gonna die. Like Josie said, it's just a quick ride through, and then we're back on dry land, hoping that my words held even a sliver of truth. In a matter of minutes, the sky turned dark, and the boat started jumping on waves, like a roller coaster rapidly going up and down. The rain tore into the boat like a machine gun as thunder sounded from across the way, lightning flashing the sky white erratically. Frank's lunch quickly escaped his stomach, coming out in an arc of brownish-green vomit that splattered across my legs and the floor. I was too scared to care, and he was too frightened to apologize. The storm kept getting worse, the waves becoming larger as evidenced by the deeper dives and longer ascensions. Water was constantly slamming the deck, some of it trickling down to our feet. Through the two small windows the cabin had, it was near impossible to know whether we were on top of the water or under it, or which way was up or down. Although the storm was loud, I could still hear Josie cursing and screaming as she battled the waves and tried to keep us afloat, which was the only indication that she hadn't been swallowed into the depths below. Frank was sweating bullets, his face a pale white. I wasn't doing much better either, the words it's gonna be okay, repeating in my mind. Slowly the storm started to ease up, the waves thinning out and the rain becoming only a slight patter. Neither Frank or me said anything, though, not wanting to jinx it before we were safely back on land. Soon, the boat's rocking lessened severely, and I could see sunshine coming through the windows. Hey guys, you okay? You can come up now. Josie yelled, her inflection hesitant but calm. Frankie apologized for the vomit as we got up and made our way up the steps. Josie was standing at the front of the deck, tumbling through her soaking wet hair with her fingers. Holy crap, did we just survive the freaking apocalypse? Frank asked rhetorically, his eyes darting between me and Josie. Josie, you okay? I asked. Yeah, I'm fine, she replied, waving her hand like nothing abnormal had happened at all. I walked up next to her and said, We got through it, didn't we? Now just let's get ourselves back on land, eh? Well, that's the problem. What do you mean? Well, look... She said, holding her hand out at the pale horizon, like she was presenting it on an invisible platter. Where's the town? What do you mean, where's the town? We got through the storm, so shouldn't we be able to get through to it now? That's the thing. It should be right in front of us. Where's the storm? Frankie yelled from the back of the boat. What do you mean, where's the storm? We just went through it. Josie yelled in annoyance, still peering at the horizon. For Pete's sake, come here, Frank replied. Josie looked at me and rolled her eyes, then started walking towards Frank as she gave a long sigh. I followed tepidly behind her. As we reached the back of the boat, I realized what Frank had meant. There was no storm, nor clouds, or even residual waves. What the hell? 
I exclaimed under my breath right as Josie started sprinting around the boat, looking in all directions, her head swiveling in frantic motions, her hair throwing beads of water around like a dog drying up after a swim. A minute later she joined us, panting, and said, It's all just water. There's nothing on any side. We're in the middle of the ocean, the storm's gone, there's nothing. Crap. Frank muttered as he started to tap his foot on the deck holding himself in a tight hug as he shivered in his wet clothes. I turned to Josie. Well, we shouldn't be far off from something, right? It's still day, and even with the storm, we couldn't have gone too far. I could see that Josie was tired. She looked like she had aged about 10 years in the last 20 minutes. Okay, you're right. Let me just check some things and figure out where to go. Josie left for the helm, leaving me and Frank to stare in silent horror at the lazy, blue ocean that seemed to stretch infinitely in all directions. After a long minute Josie called to us. Guys, you better come check this out. She was staring intensely at the dashboard of the helm as we arrived. Okay, so good and bad news. Which first? Good, please. Frank replied, recovered from the worst of the shivers. Okay, so the good news is. She began, still fiddling with controls as if to double check her suspicions. The boat seems to be in running condition. There's no damage to anything that would prevent us from going forward. So what's the problem then? I asked. Check your phones. What? Me and Frank said in unison. Check if you have a signal, internet, anything. Crap. Frank said. Yeah, mine too. I replied as I looked at my phone and saw that there was absolutely no signal or internet. Yeah, I don't have a signal either, just had to check. And it doesn't stop there. Josie said, compasses, readings, all of that, it's shot. I can't navigate us anywhere, and I have no idea where we are. Frank started to freak out and walk towards the front of the boat, his wet shoes squishing as he stomped angrily. No. What the hell do we do? Well, as I said, we can still move. The only question is where. I have a faint idea of where the sun was when we first headed out, and I suggest we try to mimic its movement back to the dock. Josie said to me while keeping her eye on Frank. Frank was now squatting on the deck, his hands gripping his neck as he stared down at his feet. That sounds smart. Then if we see the storm again, we can recalibrate. We should probably be hitting land at some point, right? I said to Josie. That's my logic, at least. You with us, Frank? I asked, turning to him. Yeah, I guess that sounds smart. He replied in a solemn voice under his breath. Need any help? I asked Josie. Take care of Frank, she said quietly. The best thing we can do is stay calm. Josie revved up the engine and turned the boat around carefully as she mapped out our approximate direction, and then we left towards a horizon that was no different from the others, guided only by the sun's approximate movements. As Josie manned the wheel, me and Frank cleaned up below deck and dried our clothes. As we were finishing up, he said he'd stay below deck, as he needed some time to think. Looking at the sun, the day was slowly turning to evening. It was summer, so we still had daylight for a few more hours. I went up to Josie to see how she was doing. Frank's below. Said he needed some time to think. I don't blame him, this is indeed a bit messed up, isn't it? Logically, we should hit land at some point, she replied, her eyes fixed on the horizon, her presence distant. How are you doing, Josie? You just pulled us through hell. I know you don't need help with the boat, but I'm just saying, I'm here if you want to talk. Josie sighed and turned to me. Thanks. I think right now what I need is to get us safely back home. Once we're back you can buy me a beer, and then we can talk. I nodded, and then turned my head to look at the horizon. Noticing something in the distance, I said, Josie, what's that? She turned her head back to survey the ocean. In the distance there were small, dark peaks rising from the ocean, like the tips of underwater mountains rising above the water. They'd appeared seemingly out of nowhere. I don't know, but I think we're gonna see soon enough. I stayed with Josie as we approached the peaks. As we got closer, it was obvious that there was no land between them. Instead, they shot up from the water in thick spirals that tapered off the higher they reached. As we got closer we could finally realize their true size. Although some were smaller than others, most were the equivalent of tall office buildings, some reaching even higher. They spiraled and twisted in the air, arcing like blades of grass in the wind, and it seemed like they could fall down at any moment, but they did not move or shake in the slightest. 
There must have been 20 or so, and they all looked similar despite their differences in size. Dark, mostly smooth yet also scratched, like charred meat on a grill. You have any idea what these are? They look like trees or something, except they don't have leaves or branches. I said to Josie, never seen anything like it. Must be some rock formations or something. Maybe there's an underwater volcano that bursted lava out, and it's solidified. I really don't know. But those should only happen deeper in the ocean, far away from land. I heard Frank coming up the stairs. He looked better than he had before, his step lighter. Although I'd been afraid he'd been brooding, I guess having some time to think really did help. As he saw the spiraling towers, his face turned into a twisted and confused half-frown as he said, What the heck are those? We don't know. I replied, but it's the only thing we've seen so far. Soon the closest spiral tower, just a mere 200 yards away, its wide shade casting upon the boat. From a distance it had been hard to decipher the dark structures, but upon closer inspection, it was clear that their anatomy was abnormal. Stretches of surface material were mostly smooth, but all of the spirals seemed to have slight craters that were formed above the rest of the exterior. It looked like they had been bombarded by meteors of differing sizes, although even if this had been the case, how had they not been immediately broken, I do not know. They were beyond any logic I could muster. So, anyone know what we're looking at? Josie asked, surprising both me and Frank. She was usually the one to know things, us just tagging along for the ride. No clue, Captain, replied Frank as he stared upwards in dismay at the towering spiral. Still no, I said. Suddenly the boat's end shot up, followed by the front, ascending us a good ten yards in mere seconds. Frank and I were knocked down on the deck, but Josie managed to hold onto the walls surrounding the helm. The boat kept rocking as waves hit us from behind. I slowly stood up with my knees bent for support, and went to help out Frank who was still laying on the deck, his eyes wide in panic. Once I'd gotten Frank up, Josie had already managed to make her way to the back of the boat. We held onto the railings along the boat's edge and walked as fast as we could through the oceanic turbulence to catch up with her. Once I saw what had produced those waves, I wanted to get back to land more than I ever had before. In the distance tens more of the spirals had emerged from the ocean, some even larger than the ones we'd seen. They dripped with water and some were covered in green sludge. Somehow they'd been quiet, merely disturbing the water as they'd shot up. We need to move. One of those things could shoot up under the boat and sink the whole thing. Josie screamed, running back inside the helm as the waves slowly calmed down and became smaller. I leaned on the railing to see if there was something underneath us, not that there was much I could do even if I saw a gigantic spiral shooting up from the depths. The water beneath the surface was unmoving, holding an abyssal darkness. It seemed as if the light penetrated less than it had before, and what was deep below was nothing but pitch black shadowlands. Just as I was about to disembark and head towards Josie, something moved in the water. I craned my neck farther over the railing to get a better look. It looked like two large masses were separating from each other, unearthing a ravine. Josie had gotten the boat moving, and we were starting to turn towards an opening between two of the spirals. As the boat circled, I got a better view of what lay below. The ravine widened, and inside it I could see a dark, whitish yellow mass peeking through. As Josie cranked us up to speed the yellow mass had opened up into a large, oval shape that seemed to span across the ocean floor. Its center held a deep, dark circle that sucked in light as if it were a black hole, twisting all things inside of it. Then it closed up. I sighed in relief, hoping that no more spirals would emerge. Suddenly it opened up again in a furious motion, wider than before, into a perfect circle. Then it hit me, it was an eye, larger than anything I could think of. Although we were moving at full speed, it was so gargantuan that we weren't making any headway. It had blinked. Josie. Frank. I screamed as I turned around and saw Frank on the opposite railing looking down at the water, witnessing the same thing I was seeing. Frank turned to me, his face a washed white, and his mouth slightly agape. Their tentacles, look. He pointed at one of the bigger spirals. They have suction cups and all. No. As if on cue, the tentacles started to return to the water, splashing as they did so, producing strong currents in the water. The boat was immediately caught up in the chaos, going up and around huge waves and being dragged by the water's shifting volume. Frank sprang below deck, and I followed him. 
From the small round windows I could see one of the gargantuan tentacles dropping back into the water, the boat just barely missing its tip, and almost sunk by the shifting ocean. Josie ran inside with us and exclaimed the storm is back. I can't maneuver the boat worth a damn. As she closed the door behind her, we were flung to the side, my ribs hitting one of the cabinets, producing a painful crack. I could hear the rain start to scratch at the boat, and soon we were engulfed in darkness, the rain gunning down on us through the waves. The boat rocked and swayed worse than it had before, and at some points I was sure we'd gone under, buried into the deep sea, never to see the sun again. We held on to whatever we could, as water trickled through the sealed door and started pooling up on the floor. Slowly, but steadily, the storm started to pass, the boat regaining its level status along the water. The darkness outside faded into a dark red. Once it was possible to stand with relative ease, we emerged from the cabin and walked up to the deck. Everyone okay? Josie asked. I think I'm gonna. Frank replied and promptly ran to grab the edge of the railing and vomited yellow bile into the water, his stomach empty of food from before. My ribs got a beating, but I don't think anything's broken. I said, what about you? I'm fine, just some bruises. Look, Josie said, walking to the other side of the boat. On the horizon, we saw the evening sun illuminating a crimson glow behind a small town some 500 yards away. Frank, Josie called out. Yeah, he replied through thick phlegm that sounded like it was stuck to his throat and running down his nostrils. We made it. We docked at the unfamiliar town and found a small hotel, probably the only one there, just a quick walking distance away. Once we got our phones dried off, Josie seemed to be the only one that still worked. As she looked up our location, she nearly dropped the phone on the ground. I don't know how, but we're quite far from home. She said, her voice produced in quick breaths. How far? Frank asked. Some 480 miles away. We checked and double checked her phone, but she was right. Somehow we'd ended up nearly 500 miles down the coast into a small fishing town. We were so tired that we decided to get some sleep before giving the bad news to Josie's dad. The next morning Josie called him up and explained the situation, giving him the simple version. A storm had hit us and after we got out we'd arrived here. I could hear the screams he gave her through the phone. Apparently he was sure we'd driven the boat all the way to this ghost town in the middle of nowhere and docked it here just to spite him. Josie didn't respond to him much, only apologizing and telling him to come pick us up. A day later he arrived, furious with us, and especially Josie. Once we showed him the boat I thought he was going to burst into a thousand tiny pieces, for I'd never seen a man so angry before. Although I think he overreacted, it was true that the boat was in shambles. There was water damage throughout the interiors, most of the equipment was shot, and large scratches were present along the exterior's white paint. Josie begged him not to drive the boat back home, but he insisted, not hearing a word her daughter was saying. We drove his car and arrived home that night. As promised, me and Josie went out for a beer a few weeks later after her dad had settled down enough to let her out of the house. We went through the events of the trip in great detail, confirming to each other that it really did happen, although we disagreed on one thing. Josie still thought that the spirals were just magma turned rock, and the whole thing was just extremely bad luck. According to her, we got held up by a superstorm or hurricane that moved our boat on top of an active underwater volcano, and then got hit by that same storm later as it moved across the ocean at miraculous speeds. Her theory was that the storm moved us along with it, making it possible to traverse such tremendous lengths with ease. But Josie didn't see what had been underneath us. Her theory was that the eye I saw was simply lava cooling down as it emerged from the ocean bed. But she hadn't seen it blink. Frank of course seen it as well, but I haven't heard from him much after the incident. According to his mom, he's been cooped up in his room, drawing yellow circles on black pages. He told her that he needed some time to think. Jacob stood at the edge of the dock, a sense of anticipation coursing through his veins. The Raven's Call, an impressive vessel with its tall masts and sleek design, towered before him. He adjusted his cap and tightened the strap of his bag, ready to embark on a voyage into the unknown. As Jacob stepped aboard, the salty sea breeze tousled his hair. 
The crew bustled around, preparing for the journey ahead. Captain O'Sullivan, a weathered man with a grizzled beard, welcomed Jacob warmly. The seasoned sailors exchanged knowing glances, hinting at the enigmatic adventures they were about to undertake. The ship creaked and groaned as it set sail, leaving the safety of the harbor behind. Jacob watched the shore recede, his heart filled with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. This was what he lived for, the thrill of exploration, the uncharted territories that awaited them. As night fell, the crew gathered on the deck, their voices carrying through the crisp air. Stories of legendary sea monsters and ghostly apparitions danced among the sailors, fueling their imaginations. Jacob listened intently, eager to be part of their camaraderie and the tales that would soon become woven into his own experiences. A sense of unease settled over the ship, like a shroud draped across their journey. Whispers of supernatural forces permeated the crew's conversations, tales of sailors gone mad and haunted vessels lost at sea. Jacob couldn't help but wonder if there was truth behind the legends. One evening, as he stood on the deck, a sudden chill coursed through his veins. He caught a glimpse of a pale figure disappearing into the shadows, leaving him with a lingering sense of dread. He brushed it off as a trick of the mind, but the rumors began to gnaw at his skepticism. Each passing day brought new omens. An eerie mist hung over the water, swirling and distorting the horizon. Strange sounds echoed from the depths, whispers carried by the wind. Superstitious sailors crossed themselves, muttering prayers under their breath. One stormy night, Jacob found himself alone in the dark, keeping watch. Lightning streaked across the sky, illuminating the ocean's vast expanse. His heart raced as he spotted a shadowy silhouette rise from the water, only to vanish in an instant. Fear gripped him, and doubt shattered his skepticism. As the ship ventured deeper into the treacherous waters, tension gripped the crew. Unease spread like wildfire, infecting even the most stoic sailors. Jacob, caught in the thick of it, couldn't ignore the unsettling atmosphere that surrounded him. It was on a moonless night when Jacob witnessed his first truly inexplicable event. The sea lay eerily still, mirroring the starless sky above. The air grew heavy, suffocating him as he gazed out into the abyss. From the darkness, a faint glow emerged, a flickering light, like a spectral lantern in the distance. Jacob's heart pounded as he strained his eyes, trying to discern its source. But before he could make sense of it, the light vanished, leaving him alone with his pounding heart. Doubts swirled in Jacob's mind. What was real and what was imagined? The crew's stories haunted him, their faces etched with fear. The rational part of him yearned for logical explanations, but deep down, he sensed that they had sailed into uncharted waters, both figuratively and metaphorically. The crew, once a tight-knit group, now fractured under the weight of uncertainty. Whispers of mutiny and paranoia spread like wildfire, threatening to tear the ship apart. Jacob knew they needed answers, a glimmer of truth to hold onto amidst the encroaching darkness. As the ship sailed further into the unknown, Jacob braced himself for the horrors that awaited them, his resolve growing stronger with each passing moment. They were no longer mere sailors, they were embarking on a battle for survival against forces beyond their comprehension. The storm descended upon them with a fury unmatched. Rain lashed against the deck, driven by violent gusts of wind that threatened to sweep everything away. Thunder crashed overhead, its booming echoes drowning out the shouts of the crew. Jacob clung to the ship's railing, his knuckles turning white with the strain. Visibility dwindled as a dense fog rolled in, enveloping the vessel in an impenetrable cloak of grey. The raven's call was adrift in a void of swirling mist. As the crew struggled to maintain their footing, panic gripped their hearts. The storm seemed intent on tearing the ship apart, testing their resolve. Jacob's mind raced with thoughts of survival, of finding a way to navigate out of this watery labyrinth. Suddenly, a bone-chilling shriek pierced the air, cutting through the cacophony of the tempest. The crew froze, their eyes wide with terror. The sound seemed to emanate from all directions, haunting and otherworldly. Jacob's skin ran cold as the shriek echoed in his ears, stirring a primal fear within him. The fog thickened, obscuring everything beyond a few feet. The ship drifted aimlessly, trapped in a murky limbo. Time lost its meaning as the crew struggled to hold on to their sanity. Whispers echoed through the fog, whispering secrets and taunting their fears. The eerie stillness that followed the storm was broken by faint, distant cries. Desperate pleas for help carried on the wind, each one chilling Jacob to the bone. 
But as the crew strained their ears, they realized the voices were not coming from outside the ship, they were from within. Jacob's heart pounded as he followed the sound, his steps uncertain amidst the mist. The cries led him deeper into the ship's labyrinthine corridors, where shadows danced and whispered secrets of their own. Every corner held a new terror, a glimpse of the darkness that had taken hold. With trepidation, Jacob opened a door and was met with a sight that shook him to his core. A crew member stood before him, eyes hollow and empty, repeating the same haunting phrase over and over again. It was as if they were caught in a loop of despair, trapped in their own personal torment. The termination flared within Jacob. He couldn't stand by while his fellow sailors were consumed by the malevolent forces at play. He would find a way to break the cycle, to free them from the clutches of this nightmarish fog. The ship became a stage for ghostly apparitions, their ethereal forms manifesting at every turn. Jacob's sanity wavered as he witnessed these spectral figures, their hollow eyes filled with despair and longing. One night, while standing watch alone, Jacob saw a figure materialize at the bow of the ship, a translucent silhouette illuminated by a pale, otherworldly light. He felt drawn to it, as if it held the answers to the terrors that plagued them. Stepping closer, Jacob saw the figure was that of a woman, her eyes brimming with sorrow. She reached out as if pleading for help, her voice a mere whisper on the wind. Jacob could feel her pain seep into his bones, a sorrow that transcended time and space. But before he could react, the figure dissolved into mist, leaving Jacob standing alone in the darkness. He was filled with a profound sense of loss, an ache that gnawed at his soul. The apparitions were more than mere phantoms, they were trapped spirits yearning for release. Jacob's mind teetered on the edge of sanity as the haunting apparitions multiplied. The once rational sailors were now consumed by fear and paranoia, their minds unraveling with each passing day. The line between reality and illusion blurred, and Jacob found himself questioning his own sanity. Sleep brought no respite. Nightmares plagued his restless mind, intertwining with waking visions that seemed all too real. He could no longer distinguish between the phantom horrors that lurked in the shadows, and the ones that inhabited his own mind. Whispers followed him, echoing through the corridors of the ship, taunting him with their secrets. The walls seemed to close in, trapping him in a claustrophobic nightmare. But amidst the descent into madness, Jacob clung to a glimmer of hope, refusing to surrender completely. Driven by a desperate need for answers, Jacob delved into the ship's history. He scoured aged journals and documents, piecing together fragments of the past. The Raven's Call, it seemed, had a dark legacy, one intertwined with curses and tragedies. As he dug deeper, Jacob discovered that each crew member had a troubled past, their personal histories entwined with the ship's curse. The revelation sent shivers down his spine, for it became clear that they were not merely victims of circumstance, but players in a malevolent game. Captain O'Sullivan confided in Jacob, sharing the ship's darkest secret. He revealed a ritual gone wrong, a pact made with the unknown. The crew, in their desperate pursuit of glory, had unwittingly invited a malevolent force onto the vessel, a force that now sought to consume their souls. Jacob's resolve solidified. He would not allow history to repeat itself. He rallied the remaining crew members, determined to break the cycle and rid the ship of its ancient curse. The time for confrontation had arrived. Armed with newfound knowledge and a sense of purpose, Jacob and the crew prepared for the ultimate battle. They devised a plan, their minds sharpened by the perils they had endured. Together, they would weaken the malevolent force, sever its hold on the ship. As they ventured into the heart of the vessel, the air grew heavy with anticipation. Shadows twisted and writhed, as if aware of the impending threat. The crew confronted their own inner demons, facing their fears head-on, determined to reclaim their ship. In the bowels of the ship, Jacob faced the entity that had tormented them all. It loomed before him, a sinister presence radiating darkness. Fear threatened to consume him. But he stood tall, drawing strength from the united spirit of the crew. With every ounce of his being, Jacob fought against the malevolent force, his weapon a blend of courage and resilience. The battle waged on, the ship itself seeming to tremble in response. It was a clash of wills, a fight for survival, where victory meant liberation, and defeat meant eternal damnation. As the battle reached its crescendo, Jacob unleashed a final, decisive blow. The malevolent force recoiled, its grip weakening. The ship trembled one last time before falling into a heavy silence, the presence dissipated. 
Exhausted but triumphant, Jacob and the remaining crew emerged from the depths of the ship. They were forever changed, marked by their harrowing journey. The ship sailed out of the fog, leaving behind a legacy of fear and survival, a testament to the indomitable human spirit and the power to conquer the darkest of nightmares. The ship sailed on, its course set towards calmer waters. The crew, forever bound by their shared ordeal, found solace in the quietude that followed their triumph. The weight of the curse had been lifted, and hope returned like a beacon in the night. Jacob stood at the helm, gazing out at the horizon. The sea stretched before him, serene and infinite. The scars of their harrowing journey would forever mark their souls, but they had emerged stronger, united by a bond forged in the crucible of fear. Life aboard the Raven's Call settled into a semblance of normalcy, though the memories of their haunted voyage lingered like ghostly whispers. The crew resumed their duties with renewed vigor, the ship now a vessel of resilience. In the aftermath of their ordeal, Jacob sought redemption for the sins committed under the ship's curse. He spent hours in quiet contemplation, reflecting on the choices that led them down this path. Guilt weighed heavily on his shoulders, but he was determined to make amends. He reached out to the families of those lost, seeking forgiveness and offering solace. Some welcomed him with open arms, understanding the depths of despair that had consumed their loved ones. Others turned away, their wounds still raw with grief. Jacob accepted their response, understanding the magnitude of his transgressions. Amidst his quest for redemption, Jacob found solace in the friendships forged during their haunted voyage. The bond they shared went beyond mere camaraderie, it was a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, the power to heal and grow in the face of adversity. Years passed, and the tale of the Raven's Call became a whispered legend among sailors. The ship remained a symbol of triumph over darkness, a testament to the indomitable human spirit. Jacob, now older and wiser, shared his story with those willing to listen. He became a voice of caution, reminding others of the perils that lurked in uncharted waters. His journey had taught him the importance of respect for the unknown, the fragility of the human psyche when confronted with the supernatural. The Raven's Call, now retired from the treacherous seas, found a new purpose as a museum ship, a monument to the crew's courage and the lessons they learned. Visitors marveled at its history, the scars of their haunted voyage, a reminder of the enduring power of the human spirit. As twilight painted the sky in hues of gold and amber, Jacob stood on the deck of the Raven's Call one last time. He gazed out at the endless expanse of the sea, a mixture of gratitude and melancholy in his heart. The ship had become a part of him, its legacy etched deep within his soul. With a final nod of farewell, Jacob descended the gangplank, leaving the Raven's Call to its new role as a guardian of stories. The sea whispered its secrets, but he knew that some tales were meant to be shared, for within them lay the power to inspire, to remind us of our own strength in the face of the unknown. And so, the legend of the Raven's Call sailed on, carried by the winds and waves, a testament to the human capacity to conquer even the most formidable of terrors. The coastal town of Cresthaven lay silent under the pale moonlight. As the clock struck midnight, I found myself on a lonely fishing boat, bobbing gently in the vast expanse of the ocean. The rhythmic sound of waves lapping against the hull, and the crisp sea breeze filled my senses, soothing my troubled mind. My name is Benjamin Reed, an ordinary man with an unquenchable thirst for adventure. Little did I know that this night would take me on a journey beyond my wildest nightmares. With a flickering lantern casting eerie shadows, I cast my fishing line into the dark waters, hoping for a bountiful catch. Minutes turned into hours, and the monotony of the sea began to play tricks on my weary mind. The moon's reflection rippled across the blackness, conjuring images of monstrous sea creatures lurking beneath the surface. My heart raced, as if it knew something was amiss. Suddenly, a spine-chilling howl pierced through the air, shattering the calm of the night. A cold sweat drenched my brow as the fishing rod jerked violently in my grip. With trembling hands, I reeled in my line, fighting against an invisible force. The water churned, an ominous whirlpool forming where my line disappeared. A deafening crash erupted from the depths as a colossal creature broke the surface, its monstrous form silhouetted against the moon. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. Razor-sharp fins lined its back, glinting malevolently in the pale light. 
its eyes glowing with an otherworldly luminescence, fixed upon me as if peering into the depths of my soul. Fear coursed through my veins, but curiosity compelled me to stay, trapped in the gaze of this oceanic nightmare. The creature emitted an otherworldly screech, resonating deep within me, unleashing a primal terror that threatened to consume my sanity. Days turned into weeks as I delved deeper into the mystery that had ensnared me. I sought the guidance of Dr. Amelia Hawthorne, a renowned marine biologist, hoping she could shed light on the horrors that plagued my thoughts. Together, we embarked on a perilous journey to uncover the truth that lurked within the murky depths. Through her research, Dr. Hawthorne unraveled the ancient legends of a forgotten civilization, believed to have perished beneath the ocean waves. The creature I encountered, known as the Leviathan, was their protector, guarding the secrets hidden in the abyss. Armed with knowledge, we returned to the waters where my nightmare had begun. The Leviathan's call echoed through the silence, beckoning us to a place where the boundary between the living and the dead was blurred. In a daring submersible, we descended into the darkest reaches of the ocean. Our vessel illuminated the murky depths, revealing a hidden world of ethereal beauty and unspeakable horrors. We navigated through an intricate network of underwater caves until we reached a forgotten temple, the heart of the Leviathan's domain. Within the temple's crumbling halls, we discovered a relic of immense power coveted by the ancient civilization. The Leviathan, both guardian and captor, sought to protect this artifact, for its awakening would unleash chaos upon the world above. As we attempted to retrieve the relic, the Leviathan emerged from the shadows, its colossal form dwarfing us. A battle ensued, a clash of wills against an unstoppable force. In the face of certain doom, a glimmer of hope ignited within me. With a final, desperate act, I plunged the relic into the creature's heart. As the Leviathan crumbled, the ocean roared in protest. The ancient civilization's curse had been lifted, but at what cost? The temple collapsed around us, and we were thrust to the surface, gasping for air as the waves embraced us. Word of our harrowing encounter spread, shrouded in disbelief and wonder. The ocean had claimed its secrets, but we were left forever changed. The echoes of the Leviathan's call resonated within me, a haunting reminder of the indomitable spirit of the sea. Years have passed since that fateful night, yet the ocean still holds its mysteries, waiting patiently for the next explorer to unravel its enigma. Driven by my encounter, I became a storyteller, weaving tales of the sea's dark depths, daring others to challenge the unknown. But deep down, I know that the Leviathan's legacy lingers, a testament to the fragility of our existence, and the boundless wonders that lie beyond the surface. And should you venture into the ocean's embrace, beware the haunting echoes that may whisper your name from the abyss.